Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick, and with me, as always, are three people who have spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he's the author of Duty, Honor, Empire, a 25th century love story, and a man who never really was a contender, Chris Haley. I hear it's not all it's cracked up to be. you got to be some kind of pigeon to do that business. Speaking of pigeons... Uh, also, Did I fuck up your joke? Yes. I can say something else. <laughs> also with us, uh, the only woman of our group and the lovely pigeon, Lori Flores. I hate pigeons. <laughs> and very self-deprecating she is as well. <laughs> Finally, the youngest member of our group and the one who's the most likely to be called punchy, Matt Palmer. Hey, we were saying in my family, I may be a nobody, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Does that equate to your entire family or just you? <laughs> it's a family thing. All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. And this week, reviewing our next pick for one of the greatest films of all time. This week, it's my pick. And I have chosen On the Waterfront from 1954 with Marlon Brando, Carl Mal- Malden, and Lee J. Cobb. And, well, and as well as Eve Mar- Marie Saint. How could we forget her as well? And I have the summary. Can you tell me a story? Written and filmed during the heart of the McCarthy era of Hollywood, On the Waterfront is the story of corruption and fear in the New York waterfront district during the mid-20th century. The film follows the story of Terry Malloy, played to Academy Award perfection by Marlon Brando. Terry is a dock worker and a former boxer whose older brother Charlie works for mob-connected union boss Johnny Friendly. Terry's years as a boxer are in the past, and now he works for Friendly on the periphery, mainly out of allegiance to his brother. Friendly rules the waterfront, and the police and the waterfront crime commission are powerless to stop him. Most dock workers play deaf and dumb to what is going on, and those unlucky few who dare to open their mouths come to a grisly end. One such unfortunate soul is Joey Doyle, who is set to testify against Friendly before the crime commission. Terry, a friend of Joey's, is used to unwittingly lure the stool pigeon into an ambush where he is thrown off of a building to his death. Terry is upset with Friendly's enforcers, believing that he was only assisting them and leaning on Joey for his silence, and is bothered by his friend's death. Terry's guilt is only further exasperated when he meets Joey's younger sister, Edie, played by Eva Marie Saint. Edie is angry about her brother's untimely death and shames the local priest, Father Barry, into action against the mob-controlled union. Father Barry holds a meeting with some of the dock workers in the hope that they will turn against the union and Friendly. The union boss sends Terry to attend the meeting and report back to Friendly as to what goes on at the meeting. However, the meeting is broken up by Friendly's enforcers, and Terry helps Edie escape the violence. Terry begins to fall for Edie, but does not tell her of his involvement in her brother's death. Meanwhile, another dock worker, K.O. Dugan, is convinced to testify about the goings-on at the docks to the commission by Father Barry. Unfortunately, Dugan is crushed by a load of whiskey in a staged accident. Father Barry rushes to the scene of the man's death and gives a powerful sermon on the docks reminding the longshoremen of their duty to right and to God. Although the priest is pelted by fruits and vegetables, his words find purchase with Terry, who is suddenly subpoenaed to testify before the commission. Overcome by his conscience, Terry confesses his involvement in Joey's death to Father Barry and Edie. Despite her growing feelings for Terry, Edie breaks up with him in disgust for his limited role in her brother's death. Father Barry plays upon Terry's guilt and leans heavily on the dock worker to come clean and testify against Friendly. Meanwhile, Friendly begins to feel uncertain about uncertain about Terry's loyalty and decides that Terry must be killed unless Charlie can coerce him into keeping quiet. Charlie attempts to bribe his little brother with a good job, but when the, that proves unsuccessful, he threatens Terry with a gun. However, Terry doesn't fear his brother and goes on to an impassioned monologue of how his brother should have watched out for him when he was a boxer instead of ordering him to throw a fight at Friendly's command. That one act started Terry on a downward spiral into Palookaville, where he became a shell of the person he could have been. Charlie gives Terry the gun and advises him to run. Terry heads to Edie's apartment, 
who at first refuses to see Terry, but finally acknowledges her growing love for the X-Fighter. However, Friendly has Charlie watched, and when he fails to sway Terry to Friendly's point of view, the Union boss has Charlie murdered and his body hung up in an alley for Terry to find. After finding Charlie's body, Terry sets out to seek his revenge on Friendly, but Father Barry prevents Terry from taking on the mobster and convinces him to testify against Friendly. Terry shows up for a subpoena and provides damaging testimony implicating Friendly in not only Joey's murder, but other illegal activities as well. Friendly now faces indictment for several crimes and cuts Terry off from employment on the dock. Terry is ostracized by his former friends and neighbors. After Edie suggests that they both move away from the waterfront together to put this behind them, Terry decides to confront Friendly at the docks. The ex-boxer shows up at the waterfront looking for work. When he is not called for a shift, he calls out Friendly and states that he is proud of what he did. A brawl breaks out between Friendly and Terry, which is soon joined by Friendly's enforcers, who make short work of Terry and nearly beat him to death. The dock workers, who witness the confrontation, show their support for Terry by refusing to work unless Terry is working too. Friendly tries to threaten the mob and is pushed into the river. Encouraged by Father Barry and Edie, the badly injured Terry forces himself to his feet and enters the dock, followed by the other workers. A soaking wet friendly, now left with nothing, swears revenge on them all, but his threats fall on deaf ears as they enter the garage and the door closes behind them. And that is On the Waterfront. All right. Films are influenced by the uh, times that they're made in, and we look back at some of the big news events of those times in Lori Flores' The Headlines of the Time. was 1954, the Senate voted in December to condemn Senator Joseph McCarthy for misconduct. Finally, with the Brown v. Board of Education of Topeka ruling, the Supreme Court unanimously banned racial segregation in public schools. The World Series was broadcast in color on television for the first time. Also regarding television, the revenue for television broadcasters surpassed that of radio broadcasters for the first time. Gross revenue for television was $593 million. The first children received Dr. Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. According to Cornell University, union membership peaked at, in 1954 at 28.3% of American workers. I thought that was an appropriate statistic. <laughs> A few of the films released in 1954 were Seven Samurai, which we have discussed, Rear Window, White Christmas, Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Which hopefully we'll never discuss. I, yeah, that's a great I'm sure that's going to be on Lori's <laughs> list. I'm nervous about my list, I have to be honest. I probably have 200 movies. <laughs> it's hard. I like movies. <laughs> and Kazan's na- masterpiece, On the Waterfront. All right, we usually start by talking about the casting of the film, and this, by my count, is the fourth Marlon Brando film that we are reviewing. Are you counting Godfather 2? No, I'm counting Godfather, Apocalypse Now. Uh, oh, Apocalypse Now. Streetcar Named Desire, and then, of course, this. Is he now number one most reviewed of oh, the no, main he's, actors? He's not even close. I think Bruce, Bruce Willis, we've reviewed five. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Uh, Hudson Hawk, did we review that yet? No, no, that was on We reviewed podcast. Hudson Hawk for number two review. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right. My films, I'm going to pick who gets to talk. Lori, what did you think of Marlon Brando? This this is in your wheelhouse. 1954, black and white film. This has got to be something that you've loved and cherished for a long time, including Brando's performance in it. You know what? I have to say something that I realized as I was watching it. I think this is the first time I have ever sat down and watched the entire film in one setting. I think I've always caught pieces of it on Turner Classic Movies or something in this which is unbelievable but I have a you know that's a fa- that line they always show that if they show classic movie clips they show him saying I could have been a contender I could have. um but he he is so amazing in this film I just I can't imagine anybody else playing it I can't there's nothing watching him there's nothing that that I would have that I could imagine changing. 
it's just you can see it's like you can you can think his every thought and look in his eyes and I mean it's just played to as you said Academy Award perfection and he's he doesn't overplay it and he doesn't it, it's just amazing well yeah I think that when I think of Marlon Brando I guess it's just for gangsters pretty much because uh well I guess he's really not a gangster in this one <laughs> he's he's officially classified as a pigeon in this one but gangster related films are what define his career to me and um I would say he does an amazing job in this even better than Godfather as much as I liked his performance in Godfather the only thing I I was wondering is I I noticed when I was watching this his eyes did were his eyes really like that, or did they use makeup to make him look more like an, a beat-up boxer? Because he seemed to have those puffy boxer's eyes, and his right eyebrow looked like it had uh, some sort of cut that didn't heal, right? Like a little scar on the eyebrow where the skin, did, where the hair didn't grow, and the skin shone through. Did, do we know if that was makeup, or was that just him? I you know I don't know. Nothing in the research I did on the film indicated mm-hmm. that that was. That he wore any kind of makeup, but I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. But I and he, that too. yeah, he he looked to me like an ex boxer, which I think helped him, you know, for the realism of his part. But I think he he really was effortless in his performance in this, which uh, I, this is probably his his best role as far as I'm concerned. I'm not sure it's his best role. But that's not saying anything given his body. You like work. him in Superman, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> it, he was fantastic. He was he was great. He he took this character on in a way I don't think anybody else could have at the time. There was the kind of um he really he really played that um blue collar guy so well. And you know, I know that's not totally inconsistent with his background, but he he absorbed that role so thoroughly. I thought it was I thought it was wonderful. Even the way he chewed his gum was I don't know. <laughs> I, his I tortured just, I, gum chewing. He I mean, just think about what he conveyed in that in that role. He was tough yet vulnerable. He you saw him fall in love with with um Edie. I mean it was it was just amazing. And a lot of nonverbal acting on his part too. No, yeah. a, tre- a tremendous amount of nonverbal acting on his part. Mm-hmm. You know, I know Matt really likes a streetcar named Desire, which I, I think is a very good Marlon Brando performance. But I think this one's better. I think he, you've seen him kind of. I mean, obviously, since Streetcar, he's 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 grown as an actor, and he he's gotten much more skilled uh, as far as a film actor. And I think he does a lot more nonverbal acting than he did in that particular film. And and you see it later in his career that I think he does a lot, conveys a lot with his eyes and his face in The Godfather years later, but. Two films that, and his cheeks, and his cheeks, of course. Uh, but two films, uh, my two favorite Marlon Brando films, two films that won Best Picture and Best Actor for him on The Waterfront and The Godfather. And I agree with Chris that there's there's parallels between the two of them. But I do think that it's it's interesting to see him at, on his A game because you know years later he 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 didn't do a lot of A list material. <laughs> so yeah, unfortunately, in our era of film watching, he did a lot of really bad movies. Um, and it, it's 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 weird to think of this is where he came from. He, I mean, he was the premier actor of his time. I, it's nice to see it's, him it's in a, shape and in acting shape. Plus, he's such a likable character. I just love that character. I don't know if he's a likable character. He's a sympathetic character. I but, yeah, I see. I I, I him. He's still hanging out with mobsters, and he knows what they do. You know, it just until it affects him, he doesn't really act on it, or until he gets that pressure from Father Barry to do something that, you know, he he doesn't really. He kind of ignores his conscience for conscience for a long time, and you know, so I don't think he's a likable. I think he's sympathetic because you know he he gets caught up in this machine um, along with his brother, who he just idolized and followed. Yeah, but when he tells you about his background, I mean, you know, what his brother did to him and he didn't he didn't have anybody else and he looked up to his brother and he trusted his brother to for guidance and his brother really let him down. I think he's very likable and it's not how you get there, it's that he got there. 
yeah, he got there. But once again, sympathetic. He st- he still followed that path. I still don't think he's likable. Sympathetic. I, I I definitely think so. Anyways, Carl Mal- Malden, Lori. Oh, actually, you started. So Chris, Carl Malden as Father Barry. He was fine. I mean, he wasn't anything special. I could have seen other actors playing the role, but you know, he was pretty much likable. He he came across as that uh, Irish Catholic type character that you would see in the big city of that time is pretty, I guess you could say it was a stereotypical priest. Did he even drink? I think he even drank in one scene and smoked. So there you go. <laughs> I thought he was really good. Um, I, I thought he did, he did better than, than most guys could have done. And what, what I was thinking of seeing him in this role made me appreciate him in a streetcar named desire even more. I thought that he, he actually, you know, portrayed that that character pretty well and he had that pretty quick change of heart towards the beginning of the of the movie there and um i think that he he really brought that that character alive and with the the kind of i think uh efforts to redeem himself that i think he he felt like he needed so i th- i think i give him a lot more credit than chris i th- i thought he was he was good i'm i pr- i'm probably in between Matt and Chris as to my scale of, of his performance. I thought he was very natural and believable as, as the uh, neighborhood priest. And, and I believe that he really cared about those people. You know, I tend to agree with Matt more on this is that, and it, and it's the comparison to streetcar is the most recent film that I've seen with Carl Malden from back in the day is that this is a much meatier role. Now I agree with Chris. I, do, I think a lot of actors could have played it, but it's interesting to see even the growth and development in him in this film from streetcar and how he inhabits the role much more, much more flamboyantly than he did in a streetcar named desire. I, I th- he was kind of, you know, you know, milk toast in that film, but that was the character he was supposed to play. But it's, it's, you know, that character that was his character's name. I believe <laughs> that, that fi- in that film, you never saw him taking on uh, as a viable threat to Brando, you know, in this film, you know, y- you could see him smacking Brando around, even though Brando's a, a prize fighter, he's not going to take any crap from anybody. So that, you know, I, I like the role he plays in this film much, much better than Street that's Street. that Irish Catholic temper, by the way, they'll, <laughs> they'll just knock the crap out of you. What about Lee J. Cobb, who played Johnny Friendly in this film? We just saw him a few a uh, few weeks ago talking about Twelve Angry Men. He seemed like the same character from Twelve Angry Men, <laughs> with just a little less introspection. He was the right guy to cast for that role, and I I gotta say I can really only recall him from from these two movies. So you know he played that character really well both times, and uh, kudos to whoever cast him. I I don't. I don't know that his was a performance that really required as much uh, as much skill as the other two we've talked about, but he fit right into it. Uh, I I disagree. I I thought he did a great job. I didn't even recognize him at first, and he just he just had this look ab- about him in the film, and I thought he also had a lot of nonverbal, a lot of brilliant body language I thought he was he was brilliant I think this was a role that was difficult and and that could have been you know the wrong you know somebody could have come in and overdone it and I just thought he was great you know it's funny because I think that there were times where he bordered on overdoing it a little bit but I do think he was very good in this part, even if it was pretty similar to 12 Angry Men. I did enjoy his performance, and I, I believed he was a, a legitimate uh, asshole that would <laughs> would send your your own brother to kill you. So, uh, yeah, I thought he was uh, – I thought it, it was a pretty well-rounded character. I, I essentially agree with Matt that there's so many similarities between this character and the character he played in 12 Angry Men. Uh, at, at least with his approach and how he takes it, that I'd almost believe that Johnny Friendly is has in a very strained relationship with his son, and that's his the torturous uh, lifestyle that uh, causes him to be as aggravated as he is towards the dock workers and is controlling uh, because uh, the, all that unpent and unresolved 
anger towards his younger son. But it, you know, it's, it, it's weird. I think of Lee J Cobb for this film and, and that film. And I know he did many other films and, but those are the two that stand out in my mind. Uh, and I, I think he does a great, he, he does what he needs to do in this film, but, uh, it, it is not, earth shattering by any stretch of the imagination, but it is effective. You know, it's, it's, he, he doesn't undersell it. I mean, I do, I do see him as a viable threat throughout the film and I almost, at at least at the very beginning, somewhat charismatic that you could see why Terry Malloy would follow him or be almost look up to him that he wants to curry favor with this guy, that he wants to get the better job because that's who his brother works for. And it's his brother's boss. And he seems like a nice guy and he takes care of you. So that, you know, the, the, that's the one difference between the character in 12 angry men that that guy was just an ass in 12 angry men and no one liked him, you know, and I, you can see why somebody might like Johnny friendly. He was kind of nice at the beginning, to be honest with you, very loyal to the people that were loyal to him. I think really see, I, I felt like he was, I, I didn't like him. I thought he, as long as you were playing his way, everything was fine. But, but you know, he had, prove that one slip up and and you were out you're on eggshells so i i didn't i didn't like him all right what about matt's moral universe portion this movie didn't really have any messages oh uh, really i didn't think so either no i know <laughs> no it 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 had a lot on its mind i and i think uh there are kind of two things and I, I think there was on the one hand a lot of strong ideas about christian manhood in the movie, and I think there are a lot of ideas about Christian priesthood in the movie. And I think um, a lot of times when when the father was really was really going, and you know, he kind of summarizes it pretty neatly in his in his rant there in the in the hull of that ship. But I think a lot of it is a movie about for how little these men will sell themselves. You know, they they had these fairly crappy jobs where they were treated terribly and arbitrarily and then they had to to put up with this guy um murdering people in order to just have the chance at getting selected for for some work and um it wasn't a lot that they were getting in return for this and they didn't aspire to much and i think that's a lot of what what the father was trying to motivate them with was just this idea of their christian duty to to stamp out corruption and I think that was more, more that than it was their se- the the self interest they had in in improving their conditions by getting rid of this guy. I think that's the way that uh, that the priest saw it, and I think that's what ultimately moved everyone as much as anything. With the example, you know, w- when someone gave him someone to rally behind. So I think there was that. I, I think you know the movie very much wants. Um, these Christian men to take a stand on a moral, on a moral ground and then reap the benefits from it as a matter of, a matter of course, as for the priest, you know, I, again, I, and when he's kind of um, chastised by the, the sister at the beginning, I think it really affects him. And I think it, um, you know, I think the movie really sees the priesthood as a, as a potential force for good in the community in, in an actual tangible way more than just a kind of a theoretical thing that happens just in the church and so i think that's that's ultimately what brought him out of the church and he was able to kind of coordinate this effort to to get rid of the the organized crime and to to improve these guys lives in a, in a very real way so I, I think the movie um yeah and it has a lot to say about that just just kind of a t- now i know these were these were real events that happen or it's based on real events but but I think that uh, the way they stuck that priest in the middle and kind of revolved everything around that instead of, um, you know, you could have you could have just as easily told a story about about a fighter standing up for these things or you could have spun in any number of ways. So no, I, I think it's it's just that. Yeah, I think Matt said it well that, you know, you just you can't just look away. And that you have to stand up to the corruption, and and if everybody kind of stands together, only then will will change come. So, yeah, it was. I agree with what Matt said. Yeah, I think there's a lot as well that it was trying to say, but it, it basically was uh, what kind of what Matt said, where 
uh, that these people sold themselves out for very little when, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it, there, it could be so much more. And so, yeah, it, it um, I don't, don't want to step on my next section too much, but it's, I don't know, it, it, it definitely is, is a lot about um, personal character and how uh, not to turn a blind eye. And, and things such as that, and I, I mean, it was also wondering how much of these were based on true events. Like, do we know if the the Catholic Church helped at all, or the Church in general helped at all with the people on the waterfront in the fifties and forties when these mobsters were in control? No idea, Matt. I couldn't find the articles online that this was based on the you know the the journalists uh, reporting. So I, I don't know much about the truth behind it, and um, I couldn't I couldn't find much without you know I, I really just did a cursory search, but I wish I knew. You know, and I tried to search too, and I didn't find anything. I didn't try and search, and I still didn't find anything. <laughs> yeah, I, I I read Wikipedia, and that's all I got. So sorry, it, it wasn't there. And if it's not there, it probably doesn't exist. So would you like me to tell my Abraham Lincoln joke? No, again? no, I don't. <laughs> So, <laughs> all right. Well, well, risk. You have an Abraham Lincoln joke? Yeah, let's not hear it. So, at risk of uh, walking all over Chris's one of Chris's themes and theories, I thought it was very interesting. No, feel free. That this is directed by Kazan. Uh, Brando almost doesn't do this film because of Kazan's involvement in the basically the communist witch hunt of the fifties. Uh, he actually testified and named names, and did not stand up as a group for all the people uh literally the theme of this film and almost why the the director or excuse me the actor did not participate in it and something that followed him for the rest of his life is his involvement in that who something he said that basically essentially that i i had to choose between two i chose the basically the least bad choice that i had in front of me both of them were bad either to testify or not testify and then be ostracized myself and i find it that especially when the film is coming out is what kind of point is he trying to make here that you know that terry malloy stands up for what's right even though he's involved in you know what was wrong at the beginning and kazan didn't and but he comes and makes this film. Do you think this is an allegory for the you know essentially the the McCarthy uh, communist hearings, Chris? And did I step all over your thing? No, I didn't really think of the film in in that manner. But I guess it, it could be. I mean, McCarthyism was a, was against communism, and you know the the union is basically. I mean, a, a communist what. Isn't what is uh, Soviet is Russian for union or council or something like that? So may, I don't know union. if he was trying to say what's that Soviet Union. <laughs> so I guess there's a little uh, bit of union. Well, in that. I don't know, but yeah, I don't know if he was saying that you know McCarthyism was against uh, communism and a union is kind of communis- communistic as in everybody is has the same power. So I don't know what they would try to be say, because, you know, this was a film about the strength of, of the people rising up against the few. And, you know, I don't know if that's the, the few of a democratic government or a communist government. You know, I don't know what he's trying to say. I'm trying to work it out in my mind and I'm, I'm not sure I see it. You know, that the, the boss in this, this movie had such a, it's so much power over these guys, and you know, I'm not sure. Did did McCarthy do much more than harass a bunch of people and and you know maybe um, destroy a few careers? <laughs> I'm, I, I don't know. So it, it, it Isn't that enough? could be, but it, it, <laughs> it's all they did. It's well, not that big a deal. Well, yeah, but I mean, the, the boss in this story is is so so over everything all the time that I, I don't know if he's trying to apologize for his involvement in that. I, I, I just, I'd have to think about more allegorically, but I, I don't know if I see it. They, they didn't have, Chris compared it to, you know, communism saying everybody's equal, but in the Soviet Union, they weren't equal. You know, those in power had and, and everybody else suffered 
if not as much as before or more than than they did you know it didn't succeed so i see the similarity in that that um the workers were were doing all the heavy work and johnny friendly and and his goons were riding high you know wearing nice clothes and and um and and i think that's how the soviet union was those in power had all the perks while the the workers so so i do kind of see a, a similarity in, in that uh chris what about symbolism well there's a lot of symbolism in this one the, the two that i w- want to talk about one deals with uh, religion the other deals with animals and birds of prey so the the first one that i noticed was to me terry was almost a uh a jesus figure who who sacrificed himself and you know father Again? barry was his god <laughs> Yep, I, I find it all these things. Uh, the waterfront workers would have been his followers, and he sacrificed himself to, uh, well, Jesus sacrificed himself before the Romans as they crucified him, and Terry uh, sacrificed him to the mafia. That's typically Italians who are in turn Romans. So Except I think there was, uh, was an allegory sin. of. He was what? He was Terry without was without sin. sin. No, he Terry wasn't. Was without sin. He- <laughs> was without <laughs> I mean Patrick but, was uh, anyway, that, but he, he didn't think he was like No, but I think there's still this allegory of him uh him sacrificing everything and then showing that you can stand up to the the authorities no matter what the cost in life will be better. I mean, that is in essence what Jesus did. He he stood up to the the Jewish authorities and was crucified for it. And, you know, Terry, the same thing. He, people were turning a blind eye to him when they, when he, uh, when he turned against the mafia. But when uh, he proved to them that standing up for yourself can, uh, can actually help and uh, improve life, the, the rest of the workers stood with him. So I think there is this Jesus allegory to this. And Jesus could have been a, con- no, Jesus was a contender, I guess. <laughs> and did you see ter- the holes in Terry's hands? From punching the glass, very Jesus-like. The other thing uh, that was that was pretty in your face, I think, was this uh, this reference to hawks and pigeons. Where I, I'm trying to remember the line that Marlon Brando said that there was more hawks in the living at the tops of buildings. Is is that what he? Do you, does anybody remember the exact quote? Not exactly, but I remember the quote. I mean that. So he he made a reference to there'd be something like there's more hawks at the top at, at tops of buildings than you would know, and then you know he's talking about pigeons, and uh, I think he even made a reference to how loyal they are or something like that. And you frequently saw Terry either outside of the pigeons or inside, and usually these little boys that looked up to him were. Um, it, it was always around the pigeons, and you know the, they basically were flocking to him. But in in the end, he wasn't a hawk. He was he was a pigeon himself, and the hawks, of course, were the were the the gangsters. I mean, even the beginning of the film, where who was who's the brother? Joey? Is he the one that got tossed off? Uh, he's not a brother. He's Joey Doyle's a friend. Charlie was his brother. The, well, he's the brother of the the girl. Oh, sorry, right. yeah, brother of the girl. So at the beginning, he was was tossed off the top of the building when. Uh, when Terry said that he found his lost pigeon and the, the gangsters were standing on the top, standing at the top of the roof, basically like hawks just waiting for their prey to take them. So th- throughout the whole thing, uh, it, there was a huge reference to, to hawks and pigeons and shitting on everybody. What was the phrase they used? Was it cheese eater for someone who cooperates with the police? A rat. Did, did you... Is it cheese well, eater, right? Oh, because you're a rat. I see. Uh, yeah, something like, I'm not going to eat cheese. <laughs> okay. That makes sense now. <laughs> Carry I don't know. That's how I took it up. That's what it meant. No, that, I think that that's exactly. Chris, I didn't notice the bird symbolism, but I see it. You're right. I just you know, thought of it as his hobby, and that was very sad when that kid killed his birds. But, but yeah, I, I definitely see the bird symbolism. Well, the little boy looked up to him, and you know he he uh, thought that that uh, he was something bigger than he was. And when he realized he was just a bird, he kind of you know that's not where he wanted to be. And I think that he was disappointed and wanted to hang out with a hawk. You know, I, I would add one thing uh, 
to the symbolism portion uh, that I should have brought up when when Patrick brought up the thing about communism. Did you guys? Did you guys? Any of you see the um, movie poster? It looks exactly like a like a communist propaganda <laughs> image. There, no, I mean it really does. Like if you was, if you look up, wasn't Kazan? Look up some the of movie stuff. poster for on the wa- waterfront. Yeah, hmm. it's got this, uh, you know, this kind of cartoonish shadowy figure smashing his fist kind of on the on the docks there and these um very sympathetic scared looking um marlon brando and uh eva saint kind of kind of under his grip it, it's it is interesting i i don't know what to make of it exactly but it, it looks like he's very red you know, looks like with a, a uh, yellow poster. crimson yeah what, wasn't kazan blacklisted no that's what i just talked about like five minutes ago Lori. Didn't. Well, I know that's what I didn't get though because I thought no. he was he didn't get work. He didn't get work cuz he testified. He didn't get well, a lot of the basically the uh, liberal Hollywood didn't want to work with him. Brando almost didn't want to do this film. So because of his involvement in that, despite the uh, fact that they made yeah. Streetcar Named Desire together. Okay. Uh what about the ending of the film? What did you guys think of ultimately the how this film is resolved? I think that's what it was building toward the whole time. I, you know, I think it, it, you know, like again, like my message said, it it's kind of a it's kind of a Christian movie, and I think that um, all of that energy with the priest and with Brando's character was was going to build towards a a beneficial resolution for these workers. So, I think it would have been it would have been very strange to end it any other way. Yeah, I, I thought it was a, a perfect ending. One thing that I did want to say is I thought of Matt because I didn't like the music. I thought the music at times was was too much. It was too dramatic. And I know Matt talks about that a lot, how he thinks music can sometimes take away from the film. And, and there were times that I was distracted by the music. Too bombastic? P- pardon? Too bombastic? Like, like Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, when it like was big, dramatic, loud, it was like, you know, su- it's like suddenly, a soap opera almost. Yeah, like suddenly go into these. It was very 50s. Very big horn section suddenly just blaring all of a sudden and instead of. Loud, yeah. yeah. It was composed by, uh, what's his face? Um, was it Bernstein? Elmer Bernstein. Leonard Bernstein. Yeah, Leonard Bernstein, which was, which was funny because I, I did not like it either. It was, I don't, I don't like it when the score tells me what to think. <laughs> And and this was just a classic case of that. Wasn't Bernstein a commie? I have n- I don't think so. <laughs> commie. <laughs> just because they were accused. That <laughs> he was a stinking red. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> He's going to take your bread and share it with everyone. Nah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, Chris, what did you think about the ending of the film? I think this was the way it had to end. I'll draw another Jesus comparison for Lori. I'll say that his getting back up was almost his little mini resurrection. And that's when the people knew that he was the one to follow. So uh, I do think it was, it, it was a pretty decent ending. I mean, it, what did bother me was Johnny Frenny. I think he's going to, to kill Terry eventually. I, I don't think that you just stand up. I mean, he, he couldn't do anything in front of the people, as he said, because the cops were watching. But I think that, you know, just kind of like in Goodfellas, where a couple years later, when uh, what's his face was going to be made and then they killed him, I think that Terry was going to be killed eventually uh, and he had nowhere to hide. So uh, I, it, it was kind of a to be continued ending for me. I, I just don't see the Jesus symbolism other than than good versus evil, but that's just me. I'll agree with Lori on this. <laughs> that I, I, although a lot of people will put you know, uh, you know, a, a, a Jesus uh, archetype in their films, uh, and I can see where the argument can be made. I don't know if that was necessarily the intention, the intention of this particular film. Although you can point out a lot of very good points that the mini resurrection and things like that. Let's talk about the film's legacy. Nominated for 12 Academy Awards, winning eight. Winning Best Picture, Best Actor for Marlon Brando, Best Supporting Actress for Eve Marie Saint, Best Director, Best Writing for a Story or Screenplay, Best Cinematography black for a Black and White Film, Best, best Film Editing, and Best Art Direction, Set Decoration, Decoration for a Black and White Film. It lost Best Music, uh, which was good because Laurie didn't even like it in this case. 
uh, to the film The High and the Mighty with John Wayne. Best Supporting Actor, three times over, Lee J. Cobb, Carl Malden, and Rod Steiger in a role that I didn't even recognize him in, all lost to Edmund O'Brien for The Barefoot Contessa. AFI's 100 Years, 100 Movies, uh, first time out in the 90s, number eight. Uh, when they redid it 10 years later, it uh, dropped to number 19. It's still a top 20 film for them. Uh, 100 Years, 100 vill- Villains, Terry Malloy was number 23 as far as a hero. Uh, Johnny Friendly is a nominated villain. Uh, AFI's 100 Years, 100 Movie Quotes. Uh, you don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. Th- number three... Uh, Best movie quote of all time. 100 years of film scores ranked number 22. Sorry, Matt. It's apparently a good film score. Uh, AFI's, or, or sorry, Lori, you were the one who didn't like it. 100 years, 100 cheers, number 36. And AFI's 10 top 10s. It was a nominated gangster film. Ranks number 126 on IMDb's top 250 films. Marlon Brando's performance as Terry Malloy is ranked number two on premier magazine's hundred greatest performances of all time that was done in 2006 premier also put the i could have been a contender line voted that the number seven greatest movie line of all time that was done in 2007 included on a thousand and one movies you must see before you die uh the vatican's list of 45 greatest films it made that list uh that was compiled in 1995 because even the vatican's weighing in on this one it shows the priest in a, a positive light was one of the films first films named to the national film preservation board's uh national film registry in the library of congress in 1989 rotten tomatoes 98 percent critics 95 percent audience so With that kind of legacy, uh, what do you think of it? And would you put it in your top 100? Lori. I love it. And it's definitely, without a doubt, in my top 100. Very, depending how you look at the list, it's probably in the top top portion, as in like top 20. Chris? There's things that I like about it. I do think that Marlon Brando, this is my favorite performance of him, maybe edging out godfather but um i like godfather as a film more i i'm not as as big of a fan of the gangster films and that's the only uh, knock that i have about this one i think the acting from head to toe was fantastic and overall it's a great movie but it's not in my top 100 simply because this isn't necessarily a genre that i that i gravitate to and there are so many mobster gangster films that we've seen to the point where some of this is almost a little cliche now. I think if maybe I would have seen this one first before the others, I would have this in a higher reverence, but um, I just don't. Um, but, you know, it's still it's a top 200 movie for me, I would say. But it's not something, if you were to ask me to see a gangster movie, this is not the one I would pick. Matt? I think the the legacy is, is pretty appropriate. I don't, I don't quite rank it as highly as, as a lot of them do. I was bored at times. I think they focused too much on the love interest and it didn't, it just didn't add as much. I think the real story was, was, was down there on, on the docks. But with that said, the, the performances from Brando and Malden are both really, really good and really captivating. And I think that, that carries the movie into my top 100, but it's, it's pretty low. This was the first time I had seen this. So I was really glad to watch it. And um, it's in the top 100. Will it still be there in, in a year or two of, of watching more movies you guys recommend? I can't say, but it's in there for now. Uh, well, obviously, my pick, so I put it in the top 100. It, this is uh, solidly within the top 100. When I think of great performances of you know, kind of the black and white era of movies, and it, this is one that immediately comes to mind. Solid performances from everybody in in, in the cast. Uh, there's not really a weak point at all. I, I, I slightly agree with Matt that the love story aspect. It, they spend a little too much time on it. I don't think it. Re- I think they could have covered it a little bit, sh- a little bit less time, and still gotten the meaning of it. What they needed for the film. Um, th- that is the only part in the film that really drags. And I like gangster films. It's a genre I do like. So, and obviously, since I've picked The Godfather and Goodfellas in this film, that, uh, you know, maybe I'm becoming a one-trick pony that I really like gangster films. But this, you know, I, I, the legacy, I think, is fully, one of the few times I think is fully appropriate. It was a, a film that 
deserves all the credit it 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 got and you know i think uh, unfortunately i think uh, the three actors nominated for best supporting actor probably hurt themselves because if only one of them had been nominated probably would have won that year so you know that that's unfortunate but it's just the way it works out but solidly within my top 100 it is not something i put probably in my top 20 but it's definitely it's definitely in my top half probably in my top 30 top 40 someplace around there but easily there now what's the story with marlon brando's oscar for this one it disappeared it was lost what's the deal he lost it at some point in time and then it showed up in auction much uh, years and years later and I think at that point he tried to get it back um, by claiming that it was his. Obviously, it has his name on it, but I don't know. How, I don't know how, what the circumstances were for it disappearing. Was this before or after he refused the Oscar? I don't know when it was later. lost. I think it appeared after he refused. Which one did he refuse? The Godfather. Huh. All right, that does it for this week's review of On the Waterfront. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network, including Movie House Memories, this show, Lunchtime Movie Review, Mail Bonding, The Number Two Review, Film House Hustlers, Sunday Seconds with the Duke and Movie House Concessions. Additionally, you can follow us on all our little side projects. Chris hosts the number two review and Film House Hustlers podcast, which also can be heard here on MHN. And you can follow him on Twitter at Haley Creative to keep up on all his upcoming podcast episodes. Lori appears regularly on Sunday Seconds with the Duke, our John Wayne retrospective podcast, where she gets an education concerning all things John Wayne from both Chris and myself. You can hear that on MHN as well, and you can follow her on Twitter at LAF335. Matt appears regularly on the Male Bonding James Bond podcast here on MHN, and you can follow him on Twitter at Haybucker. Finally, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Movie House Memories. Next time, it's Matt's turn to pick the film, and he has chosen 1974's Young Frankenstein with Gene Wilder and Peter Boyle and Terry Garr. I love Terry Garr. <laughs> okay. Second Terry Garr film like within like two months. All right. Until then, I'm Patrick. I'm a contender. Good night. <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to go eat some cheese. <laughs> and we'll cheese see you. Cheese eater. I knew it. And we'll see you all next time at our house. This podcast is not endorsed by Sony Pictures Home Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. On the Waterfront, all names and sounds of On the Waterfront characters, and any other On the Waterfront related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Sony Pictures Home Entertainment or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.